Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk, and this is going to be on the spleen, looking at some of the challenges in diagnosis. When you think about splenic lesions, there are a range of possibilities from the typical benign lesions like cysts and hemangiomas and hematomas to sort of the inflammatory type processes like infarcts and abscesses to malignancies, be it primary splenic lymphoma, angiosarcoma perhaps, or metastatic disease. So there are a range of possibilities that all of us need to think about when we look at splenic lesions. Now, the reality is when I speak about uh, splenic lesions and I do the incidental OMA talk, I do make the point that most incidental splenic lesions are gonna be benign. Obviously, you need to prove that in many cases, but also there are other causes of splenic lesions from infectious to neoplastic processes, and we need to understand all of them. One of the challenges, of course, with the spleen is that we don't have any great special splenic techniques. Dual phase imaging is probably the best thing we have. Uh, biopsies are really performed, so it's very important to be very specific as to what a lesion is and what you think it might be because most of these can be managed conservatively. Obviously, if you're thinking infection, those might be the ones that are tissue sampled, or if you're thinking about malignancy, a malignancy workup will be done in most cases. So it's a very important role radiology plays in the evaluation of these. There's a good article by Seward that goes through many of the important incidental findings of the spleen and making the point that in his experience, in his group's experience, most incidental splenic lesions are benign and need no further workup. He does make the point, however, CT imaging characteristics of benign and malignant splenic masses often overlap, making definitive differentiation difficult in some cases. Now, the purpose of his article was interesting, to evaluate whether an incidentally noted splenic mass on CT required further workup. And at the end of the day, his conclusion was that likelihood of malignancy is very low, 1%, Therefore, follow-up of incidental splenic masses may not be indicated because 99% are going to be benign. So if you're not sure what it is, the likelihood is that it's going to be benign. Now, if you're concerning for infection, often that relates to the clinical history, or the appearance is concerning to you, then obviously biopsy or splenectomy can be done. But I think in the big picture, we're really trying to think of how we can limit what is done to the patient. Such incidental findings, including masses in the spleen, which have been reported as incidental findings in greater than 14% of autopsies, most commonly represent hemangiomas, cysts, hematomas, lymphangiomas, or granulomas. And again, the emphasis benign lesions make up the high majority of splenic lesions, so you really need to be careful in not overcalling lesions, okay? So again, that's one point of view. I think we agree with that, though again, on a case-by-case -case basis is always the challenge. If the patient is febrile, could this be an abscess? If the patient has a known malignancy, could this be metastasis? Now, most of the time when you think about metastasis, if you have splenic mets, you're also gonna have other mets to nodes or to the liver. So it may not be that important because it's not gonna be a treatment change. When you look at the spleen, there are many ways of evaluating the spleen. CT and MR are probably at the top of the list. Some PET scanning is currently done. And tagged red blood cell studies, particularly when you're looking for an accessory spleen versus a neuroendocrine tumor may also be used. But it's typically focusing on CT. Now, what might be the questions you should think of when you look at a spleen or look at a splenic lesion? What's the clinical history? Has the patient had prior infarcts? That may explain the wedge-shaped defect. Has the patient had prior trauma? That may explain the calcifications. Are there prior CT scans available? Something there three years ago or five years ago is not gonna be of any clinical significance. What are the lab tests currently? Are you thinking about a lymphoproliferative disease? Or are you thinking about an abscess? Or are all the labs normal? And what are the other CT findings? When we look at the spleen and we see concurrent liver lesions, we're then thinking about lymphoma and sarcoidosis, metastasis, and infection.
If you see bulky adenopathy, you're thinking about lymphoma. So the other CT findings can prove very, very helpful to you as well. We'll look at the spleen and determine, is the lesion solitary or is it multiple? Is it large or is it small? Is there enhancement present? If there is an enhancement, is it a rim-like enhancement like hemangiomas? Think about the liver for a second. Or is it modeled enhancement with extensive vascularity like an angiosarcoma? Again, other findings in additional organs and of course, clinical history. A patient with Klippeltrenani Weber syndrome and you see multiple splenic lesions without looking, they're hemangiomas. A patient with known lymphoma, you see splenic lesions that are solid, is most likely splenic involvement by lymphoma. What are the clinical indications for CT of the spleen? Well, the reality is most of the time we evaluate the spleen, it's because it's there. It's essentially part of every abdominal CT and in great part, every chest CT. Obviously, when we're staging neoplasms, we visualize it. FUO workup, we pay careful attention that we're not dealing with a splenic abscess. Left upper quadrant pain or palpable left upper quadrant mass. Obviously, the spleen, the stomach, the pancreas are all things we're going to look at very, very carefully. If I ask the question, what's a normal spleen? Typically, 12 or 13 centimeters across the maximum length of the spleen and volumes typically under 200 grams, but lately we're not measuring volumes. We also notice that accessory spleens are common. So one of the things about the spleen, there's normal variations. Accessory spleens are typically due to failure of fusion. They usually occur near the splenic hilum. They're usually less than 3 cm, they're round, and they enhance identical to the spleen be it arterial or venous or delayed phase imaging. So it's important not to confuse a splenule or accessory spleen with malignancy or start doing a big workup. Lobulations in the spleen are very common. Clefts can cause lobulations and don't mistake clefts for lacerations or infarcts. Very important. If you look at the liver and spleen, the spleen is typically 10 Hounsfield units less than the liver on non-contrast scans. The spleen will vary in density relative to the timing of your injection and the rate of contrast injection. The spleen is brightest in early phase imaging and typically has that more pattern on early phase imaging because of its dual blood flow. And on venous phase imaging, it washes out and tends to be more homogeneous looking in most cases. There's variable circulatory routes through the spleen, both through the red and white pulp, which explains a lot of that moray pattern that we discuss. We talk about the various appearances of the spleen and the value of the different imaging types. Again, we are not doing multi-phase imaging. We can do dual phase, but we're not doing non-contrast typically, and typically we're not doing delayed phase imaging either. Most cases, when you see the spleen, it's a routine abdominal CT or chest CT. You're probably looking at the spleen in venous phase. If I'm looking for a bleed or I'm looking for an aneurysm, a pseudoaneurysm, or if I want to better define and explain what a mass is, I will do dual phase acquisition, typically at about 30 seconds and about a 70 second delay. As in any of the cases, since we want to do good multiplanar reconstructions, as well as often 3D, we use thin section CT, 0.75 millimeter thick sections every 0.5 millimeters. Now, when we speak about splenic enhancement, we talk about this serpentine cord-like enhancement being most common. This moray pattern is seen with faster injection rates and it can be exaggerated in patients with decreased cardiac output or heart failure, patients with splenic vein occlusion, or patients with portal hypertension. The moray pattern will become uniform and isodense on delayed phase imaging. Here's a good example of that moray pattern. I know I'm dictating this the end of June, July is coming. One of the challenges with new residents and new fellows, particularly new residents, both in radiology and other departments, someone looks at early phase imaging and says, oh my goodness, this splenic disease, this splenic laceration in this trauma patient. No, this spleen is absolutely normal. That's the moray pattern. Yes, there is an incidental hemangioma in the left lobe of the liver, but now compare the early and later phase images, and you can see the spleen becomes 
homogeneous, there's no splenic pathology, it's a normal spleen. Now, splenic variants can be somewhat challenging, and we could put that into several categories, one being accessory spleen, one being splenosis, and one might be ectopic spleen. Now, accessory spleens are found in up to 20% of patients. They're seen typically within the region of the tail of the pancreas as a second most common site when they can mimic neuroendocrine tumors. Most of the accessory spleens are seen in the splenic hilum. Accessory spleens can be the site of relapse or hypersplenism after splenectomy in patients with hematologic disorders with hypersplenism. Splenosis is ectopic splenic tissue caused by autotransplantation of splenic cells. Typically, it's due to trauma. You can see splenosis in the chest, in the left upper quadrant, in the midline, in the pelvis. It's a great mimicker of pathology. When you see a splenectomy and you see an enhancing lesion, one to three sonomies somewhere else, mesentery, periodic region, chest, you better consider the possibility of splenosis. It's rare to only have one splenosis, one uh, spleen, so usually it's going to be multiple and that typically will help you. We also talk about a wandering spleen where the spleen migrates from its normal location in the left upper quadrant due to congenital or acquired laxity of the splenic suspensory ligament. And these patients, because the spleen can wander, are at risk for, tr for twisting of the vascular, vascular pedicle and resulting in splenic infarct. And I'll show you some examples. We also can see polysplenia, which is a rare complex syndrome consisting of situs ambiguous with features of less left isomerism, uh, multiple spleens in the right or left upper quadrant, or single spleens or normal spleen even, anomalous position of the abdominal viscera, a short pancreas, abnormal bowel rotation and cardiovascular abnormalities are all part of this polysplenia syndrome. You can also have asplenia, which is an absent spleen, often associated with situs ambiguous, multiple anomalies, particularly cardiac anomalies, bowel malrotation, and geotrack anomalies. So you can see some of the variants of the spleen, polysplenia and asplenia, two of them can be associated with multiple other findings. And here's a good example of situs inversus with multiple splenules in the right upper quadrant. So you see the liver is on the left, the spleen is on the right. Beautiful example of splenosis. Or in this case, where there are multiple accessory spleens in the left upper quadrant, in this patient with portal hypertension. In this patient, you can see that there's interruption of the IVC with the polysplenia, very nicely shown. Now, splenosis is an acquired form of ectopic splenic tissue that typically arises after trauma or splenectomy. Most common, it's either a traumatic splenectomy or it's trauma itself. Again, it's very important to be able to think about splenosis. Uh, when the radiologic findings support the diagnosis of splenosis, make the diagnosis, because then the patient is spared invasive procedures for tissue sampling. That becomes very important. Ectopic splenic tissue can be found in the body in three forms, splenosis, accessory spleen, or wandering spleen. And as we mentioned, splenosis is often an incidental finding as most patients are asymptomatic, so its true incidence is unknown. However, studies suggest that up to 67% of patients with a compromised splenic capsule develop splenosis. So it's just a matter of how large this splenosis is and how well you're looking for it. If the diagnosis of splenosis remains uncertain on CT or MR, a tag, uh, technesium labeled sulfocolloid scan or heat damaged RBC study may be helpful uh, because of their high sensitivity and specificity for detection of ectopic splenic tissue. So again, these nuke studies can be valuable in the cases where there's uncertainty. Now, one thing I'll also mention is an accessory spleen, and we've seen a few of these, or, or rather we see them a lot. Most of the time, it's not gonna be a problem. Um, accessory spleens are common. 10 to 30% of the population. So what do you do with these accessory spleens? Here's a nice example. You can see from this case, since the spleen enhances, it could look like a pancreatic mass. That often is one of the challenges. 
Again, accessory spleens, splenules, typically enhance like the normal spleen. So when we talk about accessory spleens, they're usually 2 cm or less in size. They enhance to similar both on arterial and venous phase imaging to the uh, normal spleen, but can simulate pancreatic, renal, or adrenal pathology. Here's a nice example of a large accessory spleen near the splenic hilum. Location is great. Look at its moray pattern, just like the native spleen. Venous phase, you can see this washes out, as does the spleen. Very classic accessory spleen in the splenic hilum. Here's another example. Here's an accessory spleen sitting anterior to the pancreatic tail, but separate, sitting right by the splenic hilum. You can see its appearance on early phase imaging, as well as on the venous phase imaging, where you see washout of the spleen and accessory spleen, and they look identical, go back and forth between here and here. It looks identical. And here it is in the coronal view as well, showing its enhancement, similar to the native spleen, very nicely shown on the 3D mapping. And then as you wash things out, it became equivalent. Now, one of the things to remember, as we commented before, and the easiest way of really recognizing an accessory spleen, if you're doing a study for that, do dual phase imaging, because you can see here that the early phase, that moray pattern, is also in the accessory spleen, which makes the diagnosis a home run diagnosis. That's not the appearance of a neuroendocrine tumor, for example. And here it is in 3D. And here it is very nicely shown with cinematic rendering that moiré pattern. Now, sometimes we always mention about the splenules or accessory spleens being by the hilum. Here was an interesting case of left upper quadrant pain. And there's a mass that looks like it's the spleen but it's sitting above the spleen. Here it's not quite the splenic attenuation, but on other images we surely thought that this was probably splenic tissue. But again, look at its enhancement. In fact, it's greater than the spleen. What else could this be? I don't know, we were sure it was the spleen, but the patient had left up a quadrant pain, and maybe it's because it's sitting by the diaphragm that's the issue. This was resected and this was accessory splenic tissue. Just a beautiful example shown on the 3D imaging, on the cinematic rendering, really nicely shown from a posterior view. Another case, here's an example of accessory spleens away from the splenic hilum. Again, don't confuse that with an omental implant or here with multiple accessory spleens. Don't consider this implants as well. I think implants you consider the more when it's away from the left upper quadrant and it's down more by the midline or it's in the pelvis. But it can be challenging either way. Here's an accessory spleen, which actually in these images looks like an adrenal mass. But then when you get all the images, the adrenal looks fine. And this is simply an accessory spleen simulating an adrenal lesion but they're far enough apart so it's not much of a problem. And here it is again on the 3D imaging. Now, after traumatic splenic injury or splenectomy, small isolated spleens may develop. In this article by Lake, we showed a number of different cases. Here's a nice splenosis just near the tail of the pancreas and anterior to the kidney. Again, well-defined, round and smooth. Again, it's not likely a carcinoid, no desmoplastic reaction, and the splenectomy always does help you reach the correct diagnosis. But again, you can see it's away from the spleen, and if you're not thinking about that absent spleen, you could start reading mesenteric masses, Castleman's disease, carcinoid tumors, things like that in the mesentery would all be something you would consider. Another example of splenosis with multiple splenules in the left upper quadrant, as well as in the midline on the omentum. So again, it's enhancing, it's brighter even at this point than the kidneys. Here it is on the 3D volume rendered views. Very nice example of the splenules here, and then in the midline on the greater, greater omental region, very nicely shown here as well. Now we could also see them in the pelvis, and you can see in this case, you could see the problem. If you don't think about splenosis, 
This looks like nodes or even a carcinoid tumor without desmoplastic reaction, uh, enlarged nodes from lymphoma or something. So it can be somewhat challenging. Now, again, looking at the entire skin, when you have splenosis in the pelvis, you'll typically see it other places as well. You can see here, it's between the kidney and the liver. So again, it's something to think about. Again, the point I'll re-emphasize is accessory spleens enhance like normal splenic tissue on arterial and venous phase imaging, but often these accessory spleens, these splenules far away don't enhance quite like that. And also the challenge is, if you've had a splenectomy, there's no baseline to compare to. Now here's a good example of a lesion by the tail of the pancreas. Again, splint, this is an accessory spleen, or is this a neuroendocrine tumor? That is indeed a good question. It's kind of challenging, but you see from the shape, it's pushing into the pancreas, and it's sitting right on the spleen, and it enhances just like the spleen. So this is an accessory spleen, and not a neuroendocrine tumor. And of course, that's very important because with neuroendocrine tumors, you're gonna end up doing surgery. And here it is very nicely shown, particularly on the coronal view and on the volume views as well. Now, this difficulty in accessory spleens or splenules versus neuroendocrine tumors is a real problem. And I'd like to share a few more examples, but let's take a break here. Let's get a drink of coffee and come right back and we'll pick up with the lecture right here. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.